epidemics we have in America is there's a lot of teaching, there's a lot of knowledge, there's a lot of head knowledge about Christianity and about the Bible. But what we really need is we need accountability and we need fellowship and we need people getting in our face and saying, okay, so that was a great sermon. What are you going to do about it? What is God speaking to? What are your goals? How are you going to grow in your marriage? Are you going to get a budget for your finances? That kind of thing. This is the L3 Leadership Podcast, episode number 176. What's up, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the L3 Leadership Podcast. My name is Doug Smith, and I am the founder of L3 Leadership. I hope your 2018 is off to a phenomenal start. In this episode, you're going to get to hear me interview Carolyn Haas, who is the co-lead pastor of Substance Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I was blown away by this interview. Carolyn is incredibly insightful. She's hilarious, and she provides a ton of resources in this interview, all which I'll include links to in the show notes. Um, But personally, I was so impacted by this, I plan on listening to this episode over and over and over over again. Um, it, it was that good. And so uh, if you want to learn more about Carolyn and her church and links to everything that we talk about in the interview, uh, you can check out the show notes on our brand new website that just launched this week at l3leadership.org forward slash episode 176. You'll also be able to listen to my lightning round interview with Carolyn in episode number 177. But before we dive into the interview, just a few announcements. Hey everyone, I just want to take a minute and encourage you to become a member of L3 Leadership. Our vision here at L3 is to connect and develop leaders to help them maximize their potential. And when you become a member, you'll have the ability to join or start one of our mastermind groups. You'll have access to our community of over 100 leaders, and you'll also have access to the tools and the resources that will help you take your life and your leadership to the next level. You can get all of this for just $25 a month. If you want to learn more about membership or sign up today, you can go to l3leadership.org forward slash membership. I also want to thank our sponsor, Alex Two Landon, who's a full-time realtor with Keller Williams Realty. If you're looking to buy or sell a house, Alex is your guy to talk to. As a member and a supporter of L3 Leadership, he would love the opportunity to connect with you. You can find out more and connect with Alex at pittsburghpropertyshowcase.com. And with that being said, let's dive right into my interview with Carolyn, and I'll be back at the end with a few announcements. Hey, Carolyn, thank you so much for being willing to take the time to do this interview. And why don't we just start off with you just telling us a little bit about you and who you are and what you do. Thank you, Doug. It is such a pleasure to be on this podcast. So my name is Carolyn. I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, I love the Twin Cities. I know a lot of people haven't been to Minnesota, but it's an incredible state despite our cold winters. Um, Hmm. My husband, Peter, and I, we've been married actually in two weeks. It'll be 22 years. So super excited about that. And then of those 22 years, we've actually been in full-time ministry together for 21 years. And so we've just newlyweds, got in right away into full-time ministry and they just have been serving together two different churches. We were youth pastors and then we took over the church for, you know, so we were at a church in Wisconsin for nine years and then we planted our current church that we're in right now, Substance Church, 13 years ago in the Twin Cities. Uh, we've got three kids that are 16, 14, and 11. I love being a mom. It, it seriously is the best. And, um, and I love leadership in the church. I just, I love serving with my husband. I love um, being a part of what God's doing in the local church. Wow, that's awesome. You have a full plate for sure. Um, I didn't realize you were in ministry for 21 years. And I'm just curious about uh, leadership in the church. What trends are you seeing uh, in leadership today in the church world? And really over the past 20 years, what, where have you seen leadership gone in the church? You know, what's so interesting is I've seen I think so. I think everyone would say this, but social media has so changed the world that we live in. And, and, and so it's this instant everything you're documenting your life. And, and we actually laugh at, you know, what it was like to do, you know, life without, you know, before the internet, before yeah. emailing and before, you know, texting and all that stuff. Um, but so what I've seen is social media is so loud um, that I've just seen a real decline in people knowing God's word, having a relationship, a deep relationship with God, his presence. And I've actually just seen the world. It just feels like the world is getting louder and louder because it's, you have to fight against it. You know, before you didn't have the internet and you didn't have social media and smartphones. And so it just wasn't, you had to go buy a magazine or a book, you know what I mean? Or watch the TV. And now it's just everywhere. So I I feel like in the church world, um, I'm seeing that even with, with pastors and leaders where people are so busy and there's this comparison with other churches, with other pastors, with other leaders. Um, it's in, and I know everyone talks about it, like living life on Instagram, you know, versus what's really going on in your life. Um, but part of that, and then I've seen the trend of just the American life is getting busier and busier. And I feel like as the American family continues to fall apart, 
you know, it's the American trend to just have your kid in a bazillion sports and every music lesson possible and, and family dinners are declining. And so you're just not seeing a strong culture of family, which really impacts the church in the sense of discipleship. And, and so we're seeing, you know, trends as far as attendance, people are not attending, um, consistently so they'll attend once a month and and so we're just seeing huge trends with church attendance you know that that have just been a battle so we've noticed that we've had to actually teach people what it means to be planted in the house of the lord and not in a legalistic way super life-giving my husband will give the statistical benefits you know research driven statistics about church attendance <laughs> and what it does and, and and so we're always sharing stories and again being really life-giving not legalistic about it but we just noticed these trends of of busyness that we've seen you know just again teaching and then the other trend i've noticed is you know our first nine years of ministry were in a rural central Wisconsin. And in rural Wisconsin, nobody moved, nobody left your church, <laughs> nobody came to your church either. You know what I mean? It was like, it was just this steady group of, of long-term Christians, if I could be honest. And then we moved to the Twin Cities and it's super urban and transition, you know, everyone's moving and coming and going. And so it definitely was a shock for us to transition from rural to urban and realize you know, people are coming and going. And so people are church shopping and they're church hopping and they, you know, and so again, we've had to really teach, Hey, that's actually, you know, God doesn't cause people to stay in a church forever and ever and ever, but there's healthy ways. How and when, and why do you leave a church and how do you actually do it in a healthy way versus just, you know, uprooting yourself. And so those are some of the trends that we've had to navigate. Yeah. Can you talk more? I'm just curious. Can you talk more about how you combat that? Um, specifically the American life being busy. I know you said you guys kind of share the statistics, um, but talk to that person who, who doesn't necessarily see the benefit of planting somewhere. What, what would you tell that person? Well, we, we, so we preach on it in our services. We talk about it in our small groups. We definitely talk about it with our staff and our leaders. We share stories and, and what we're seeing is that those who literally attend every week, like they have dramatically more miracles happening in their life. Hmm. They're thriving in their spiritual walk. Their, their kids are thriving. They're seeing the presence of God. Whereas people who are like attending once a month, they're disengaged, they're disconnected, you know, they're, they're not seeing the miracles. And there's, and there's literally that those who are in attendance, not just once a week, but even if you attend church twice a week, so we're talking a small group and weekly church attendance, you, you're like head and shoulders, the happiest, like, the, like you're going to live longer than everybody else. You're going to thrive. You're going to have further education, like less sickness. Like my husband has all the statistics in the study and I can get that to you and you can post it on, yeah, the, on the podcast. Yeah, that's amazing. But the research is crazy. And then are you ready for this? The worst group, the most miserable group of people on planet Earth are Christians who attend once a week or once a hmm. month. So it's like because they have this partial belief but it's not actually, it's like a form of godliness, but they're denying the power. They're not actually allowing, you know, the church community, the body of Christ. They're not giving consistently. They're not serving. They don't have ownership in the church. They don't have community. So they're going through life alone. They think they're experiencing God. They think they've had knowledge, but they haven't converted into heart knowledge. Wow. That is, that's so good. I mean, so often I hear pastors just say, well, you just need to go, <laughs> go every week to stay connected. And I know what they mean, but to actually... That's the best answer I've ever heard with that. So uh, I would love to see those statistics if you have them. Um, and I, oh, I want you. you. It, go go ahead. ahead. No, after you. I was just going to say, it's, it's literally so fun as a pastor. Because I've even told our congregation, I said, listen, I'm not telling you to come to church because it makes me feel better. I don't need your attendance and your numbers. And that doesn't boost my ego. That doesn't something I brag about. Like I feel better as a person because there's more people in my church. I literally care about you as a person. And I don't know about hmm. you, but if I wasn't forced to be at church every week and in small groups and in leading, I'd be glutting out on Netflix and you know, wow. becoming obese and lazy. You know what I mean? Because if we all live by our feelings, that's what it's going to lead us towards. And there's something about the discipline of being planted when you don't feel like it. And I'm telling you, God speaks. And so the other thing that we encourage people to do is, again, not be consumeristic with their church attendance, that it's not all about you. You know, yes, you come to church to receive, but you also come to church to give. There's more blessing in giving than in receiving. And so I come to church trusting God for divine appointments, divine conversations. Lord, who am I going to pray for today that's going to get healed? Who am I going to pray for that's going to give their life to Christ? Who can I connect with that's feeling lost and discouraged and that doesn't know the peace of God that I can help impart life to them? So I think it's giving people a mission, not just consumerism. I'm ready to go to church right now. You have, you have me very fired up. <laughs> That's amazing. All right. And you said, That's I love, awesome. you said, you said the discipline of being planted. I just want to throw that out there. I don't know if you've ever thought about writing a book or if you have, but uh, that might be a great title and book. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Future. Well, and people are afraid to be honest. People are afraid of that concept of being planted because they're afraid it comes out of a heart of control or abusive, yeah. or there was an old mu- movement, I think called the shepherding movement where people felt oppressed by pastors. And that's not the heart. To be honest, we've seen so many young people uproot their community and go to a different church because the grass is greener, or we just started challenging them on some of their character issues and they upped and left because they weren't comfortable with being challenged. And they went to the next church down the street where they could hide in anonymity and not be known. You know what I mean? And, and then we watched them five years later go on this crazy five-year detour. And it's just so, I mean, God loves them the same. We love them. We're not mad at them. There's no rejection or, again, it's not about my ego or my identity. It's, I truly so care about this person. And when I watch you take this detour, I, my heart now with wisdom and experience and watching this for 21 years, I'm going, there's something about the people that stay planted, that have tough conversations, that press through the pain. And and, and my husband wrote a blog on literally it was three ways, how, when, and why to leave a church. And what's brilliant about it is and, and we teach this to our people. Hey, listen, we, even as the senior leaders, have to reinvest in the church every two years. And we, our friendships change. And our emphasis and our seasons of life change. And so the hardest time is when your friends change, when they move, when they transition, like, or a ministry changes, a leader changes, people feel lost. And that's the moments where they disengage and all of a sudden they transition out. And so we have to teach people, hey, listen, we all have to reinvest and re-give ourselves to the Lord, re-give ourselves to building his church. And we have to navigate what is ministry and ownership in the local church look like in my current season of life. And so everything we do at Substance is really helping, almost like guidance counselors. We want to help navigate with people. Okay, so you just had some kids. What does that look like in your current season with the job that you have? How do you have community? How do you have involvement? So you're not just a spectator. And so we really are very individualistic in our approach of just trying to help each person, each family find their place in the current season they're in. I love that. Uh, the other trend that you guys said you have to navigate is is just the world of social media and our world getting louder and louder. And I'm just curious, maybe just for you personally, or even maybe how you guys teach your staff in your church body, how do you combat that? You know, how do you get quiet? How do you grow in the word of God? So you're not just, you know, not going deep, don't have a great relationship. Can you just talk more about that? I thought that was interesting. Yeah, those are great questions. Um, again, my husband has written blogs on social media, like how to get your social media saved, you know what I mean? like <laughs> how to not like vomit and puke all over Facebook. And, and, and even during, just to be honest, during the election this last year, you know, it, it, I think all of America was polarized and every church was polarized and people were vomiting on both sides all over social media. And, um, and it just didn't feel safe. And so we went pretty hard in our church services and just said, listen, social media is not the place to be having these conversations. You have faced face conversations with people, but do not be puking out your fears and don't be name calling and judging people on your social media. Like you're, you're losing influence. And so we, we teach our staff, we have a lot of actually strong social media policies of, listen, this is not where you, um, you don't debate with people on social media. You don't confront people on social media or even text, you know, so we have very just strong parameters of anything that's emotional, anything that's emotionally charged, any that, that is all personal, that is face to face. Because in the world of text, I mean, I've made so many mistakes of texting somebody or emailing somebody, and it's just, they, they didn't hear my heart, they didn't hear my voice, they didn't know what was going on, they read it wrong, and it offended them, and, and I've had to apologize. And, and so we've all made mistakes, and we've all made mistakes of getting defensive and reactive on social media. And so to us, it's, it's more of a, let's use it to influence people, let's be life-giving, let's, let's, you know, we can put scriptures, let's, you know, so anyway, so we just try to keep encouraging, hey, Mature communication, healthy communication, face to face when it comes to debatable issues. That's good. And just, uh, I feel like I'm going to take all of your resources, but is that something that you guys make public, the, the social media policies? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, we don't re- have our staff policies, but my husband's written so many blogs. Okay. So I'll look those up and get those to you. And then I'll look, because I know we, we even have had um, social media policies for staff that have transitioned off. And, wow. you know, in this world of young people, you know what I mean? They'll go to the next church and tweet best leadership teaching I ever heard. And then all their friends are confused. Like what you just <laughs> left substance. And now you're tweeting about this other church and it's just confusing. And so we've said, Hey, listen, there is some social media protocol when you transition off church. And again, it's not, we're not trying to be controlling. We're trying to actually help the people who are grieving as you've transitioned out of your job, as you've transitioned to another place, there are people that are grieving your loss, the loss of you being not in the organization. And so how can we 
handle our social media in a way that that is honoring, that's life giving. So we have some of those that aren't published, but I, I they're somewhere in our archives. Sure, no, that's so good, and I'll, I'll make sure I share all those links. I can look at those up as well. Uh, you talked about creating policies, but really you're shaping a, a culture within your organization. Correct. Can you yep. can you talk about culture? Maybe the culture you've tried to create, how you've tried to create and sustain that culture throughout uh, the life of your church. Absolutely. Those are great questions. You know, part of it was, so my husband is a, a learner. One of his strength finders is learner and he, he just loves to research. And, and we kind of joke that he's this nerdy guy who reads scientific research, you know, all the time. And he loves to find research studies that back up what the Bible teaches. And, and honestly, when you're, when you're preaching to a postmodern uh, culture and especially Minnesota, it's, it's not, um, it is very post-Christian and it's not Bible belt. And so people have no problem telling you they're not a Christian. You know, it's just a very different than in other parts of the United States. And so in that culture, you know, so all of his sermons and even his books are all and his blogs are all one third scientific research, you know, one third scripture and one third humor. So that's kind of been my husband's recipe. And so when it comes to our substance organizational culture, there's actually two research studies that really help formulate you know, you've got, you've got the Bible, the Holy Spirit, of course, that's a given, you know, culture of prayer. Um, but, but one of them was, I'm not sure if you've heard of it, it's called the NCD method, natural church development. And it was, it's an assessment that was done years ago by a German author. And over 10 years, hundreds of thousands of churches, he researched and studied globally, like what are the universal health and growth measurements that you can predict a church is healthy and you can predict if they're going to grow based on these eight universal principles. And it's not about what works in California versus Minnesota versus Florida, but it's, or Africa, you know what I mean? But it's, these are universal. And so we took those eight principles and then you can actually like test your church and see where you're at. And it's just Hmm. so cool. So we took those eight principles and really those were a formation for our culture, for our church, for our methodology, even, and just how we, and they're all things that we'd all agree on. It's inspiring worship. It's empowering leadership. So you have a culture that you're empowering people to lead. Um, It's gift-oriented ministry. So you're helping identify people's gifts and getting them involved in ministry based on their gifts. It's passionate spirituality. So you're passionate about the Bible. You're passionate about fasting, scripture memory, those kinds of things. Um, Then it's functional structures. So that's speaking to your church governance, your finances, making sure that your actual behind-the-scenes structures are functional and healthy. It's holistic small groups. You can't be a church that just has small groups. You have to be a church of small groups. And so that's one of the eight, you know, universal principles of health and growth. Another one was need oriented evangelism, where you're actually meeting people's needs while Mm. evangelizing them, not just sharing the gospel with them. And the last one was loving relationships. And it was literally talking about how, again, Jesus said, you will know they will know you are Christians by your love. And so is our community so full of love and, and, and relationships doing life together that, you know, that's what causes health and growth. And so we took those eight things and literally incorporated everything we do in the church. And so we're super relational, super small group driven. Um, and then the other study that we did, this is kind of interesting, actually 2004 group publishing did a study and they actually said, what, are, what actually causes spiritual growth? And, and anyone could answer those questions. Well, it's, it's God's presence. It's his word. It's prayer. It's Christian friends. Those are great. But the number one statistical predictor of spiritual growth actually came out as how many intimate Christian friends you have in your life right now. Wow. And they actually said you can preach God's word to the same two people, but the, the same quantity of God's word. Yet the one who has the intimate Christian friends is the one who's statistically likely to actually apply God's word. And so I feel like one of the epidemics we have in America is there's a lot of teaching, there's a lot of knowledge, there's a lot of head knowledge about Christianity and about the Bible. But what we really need is we need accountability and we need fellowship and we need people getting in our face and saying, okay, so that was a great sermon. What are you going to do about it? What is God speaking to you? What are your goals? How are you going to grow in your marriage? Are you going to get a budget for your finances? That kind of thing. So, so, so we, it literally even went as far as if you can get four to seven strong Christian friends in your life, you will have longevity in Christ and you will experience more miracles. You will actually love your church and, and you're going to experience, you know, stay in Christ over the long haul. The second predictor of spiritual growth in statistically, according to this study in 2004, was that you have a, people have a weekly ministry in a local church that charges them up, that just energizes them, that they're owners in the church versus a spectator in a church service. And so 
actually, so those two things that kind of became our slogan when we planted the church, four to seven friends in a ministry, four Mm. to seven friends in a ministry. Our goal at Substance is to get you, when you come through our doors, we're trying to get you four to seven friends and we're trying to get you a ministry that charges you up. And, And those things obviously fit with the eight universal growth you know, and health um, values from natural church development. So it kind of all worked together as being a super friendly church that's super into small groups and relationships and accountability. And, and again, not in a legalistic way, but sure. those are really the core values and the culture that, that we definitely have tried to build the church on. And, and I would say the DNA of the church has stayed the same for 13 years. Now, the culture has definitely bounced up and down and changed a little bit based on different leaders, different staff. And so we've had to really, we've really learned a lot about, ah, you know, <laughs> we, you know, there's the culture you uh, allow, there's the culture you create, there's the culture you maintain. And so we've learned so many mistakes of, oops, hmm. you know, we believed this, but we didn't manage it. And we thought everybody knew what we believed on this, but we didn't do a good job of um, stopping that or having some tough conversations. So we've definitely learned some lessons on sustaining the culture and recreating it. I don't know if that makes sense. No. In fact, can you, can you dive a little bit deeper? So how do you, you know, if I were to come work for you today and, uh, and you wanted to get your heart and, and mine and your staff and your people, how, do you guys just, do you guys teach it every week? Is it just consistently communicating it? You, you kind of mentioned having hard conversations when um, someone's not applying to the values. Can you talk about how you embed that? Yes. So I don't know if you've read the book, The Advantage by Patrick Lencioni, but one of the things I love about that Oh, it's, it's brilliant. What I love about the book is he talks about getting your like executive team together and really identifying what the core values are of your organization. And then you kind of implement it out amidst the staff. And, and one of the things that he identified, so for example, in that book, he talked about one of their values of we sweep the floor. And it was purposely something fun that only their culture would understand. We sweep the floor literally means no matter if you're an executive or not, we do anything. We will do whatever's needed. We take out the garbage, you know, like we aren't above doing anything too small in the organization. And, and so what that did is by identifying some of these values, they were interviewing somebody and all of a sudden the, that executive was like, dude, I don't sweep the floor. I'm sorry, this is not a fit. And so because they had some of these values identified, it really helped in the interview process. And I feel like it's actually taken, I mean, this, I hope this isn't embarrassing or awkward, but it's taken us 13 years as a church to really identify what are essential to being a staff member at Substance. And we've learned from so many mistakes of, oops, we didn't patrol that. Oh, that was an attitude that we let slide. And that really was damaging to our staff culture. And that had an influence over here. And, and again, God is growing us as leaders. And so, you know, if, if I'd ever write a book, it'd be, here's all the leadership mistakes I've made, you know, and please learn from my wisdom. You know, here's things that you can do differently, you know, that I did. Um, so I feel like just now we're actually kind of a a secret document. Our staff haven't even seen it, but it's, it's a working document. That's just what are our core values that as we hire and as we vet different staff members, we run through a list of probably 15 things that we just kind of over hours and hours of conversation, we're, we're checking out their character and we're checking out, you know, um, their issues and where's their identity, and, you know, and that kind of stuff. And so um, some of the mistakes we realized was, you know, we were just too, too nice. I'm, you know, Peter and I are just so nice and, and <laughs> we're definitely not going to be like these militant leaders. And so like, we would just let people get away with things or we wouldn't be willing to have the tough conversations because it was hard, especially as the founding pastors to have some of these tough conversations. And so to be honest, the best thing that has like changed our life is our, our executive pastor, Nate Piccini is brilliant. And he just hears our heart, loves, you know, the vision and, and doesn't have his own vision and is all about helping manage the culture of our staff and helping shape it based on what's our heart. And he gives us permission to be able to speak to everything in the church and say, what do you guys want? And what do you want for this? And what do you want? And then he enforces it. And so he's constantly having tough conversations and, and correct, you know, but, but he's got, as John Maxwell says, he does it with care and candor. And so a lot of leaders are all candor and then a lot of leaders are all care. And so to really walk in that balance of, you got to care for people, but you also have to be able to speak some truths and say, hey, we got to work on this. That's not the culture that we have here at Substance. 
I love that. Um, while you were talking, you had mentioned at one point that, that Peter was a learner, uh, according to Strength Finders. I actually watched uh, a talk that you gave, and you were talking about how much you love Myers-Briggs. And you actually went through a <laughs> list of everything you can tell about someone uh, through their Myers-Briggs <laughs> thing. And I was like dying. I'm like, well, I'm not telling you what I am, but you can probably guess. But I'm, <laughs> can you talk about just self-awareness and, and why these assessments like Myers-Briggs or Strength Finders, DISC, all these ones are so important? Uh, for leaders? Yeah. Well, you know, emotional intelligence is, it's really being able to identify your own emotions and then it's identifying the emotions of others around you. And then it's negotiating a win-win. And, and so a lot of people don't even know their own emotions and, and, and then, or you might know I'm feeling angry right now, but you don't know what to, you can't control your anger, you know? So it's knowing your emotions, but then being able to control your emotions, being able to correctly learn what other people are feeling, reading the room, and then being able to, you know, navigate a win-win. And so emotional intelligence is something you can actually grow in. And so Peter and I, you know, newlyweds, first year of ministry, we both had our personality assessments done with Myers-Briggs. And I'm telling you, it changed our lives. Like our fighting went like from hours of fighting (laughs) to literally barely any, because we're so different with our personalities and, and we will forever see the world differently. We will forever communicate differently. We tell stories differently. And so instead of trying to correct each other into my way is right or his way is right. There is no, I love how Myers-Briggs puts it. It's the, the concepts that they teach. It's, it's like your right and left hand. Hey, you, you're right and left-handed. You use both, but one of them's stronger. And so it doesn't mean your left hand's bad or your right hand's bad. It's just, which one are you stronger in? What's your preference? And so understanding how my husband operates and thinks just helps me. It helps me appreciate him. It helps me pull on his strengths versus compare myself to him. And I wish I was more like Peter and I wish I thought like him. I'm never going to think like him. Mm-hmm. So therefore, instead of being insecure or comparing myself to other people, I can actually understand. And I love what Sean, you know, Sean and Stephen Kobe both talk about in Seven Habits. You know, seek first to understand, then be understood. Well, how am I supposed to understand people if I don't know how they're wired? And And let me give this disclaimer. We don't ever believe that personality assessments are an excuse for behavior. Like I don't, I tell our staff all the time, I don't ever want to hear, well, I'm a, (laughs) I'm a, I'm a J, I'm a P, I'm a, whatever it is. Therefore I always do this. No, 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 no. This is not an excuse for behavior. This is a launch pad for growth. So let me give you an example. When I was early in ministry, I read my personality assessment and it literally said, your particular personality, I'm an ISFJ. And it said, you work, 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 and then play, um, when the work is done, but because the work is never done, you never play. And Mm -hmm. when it said that, it just unlocked something in me because I'd seen a trend in my life for 10 years of being more on the workaholic side of life. And I just appreciated seeing that, but I didn't say, oh, guess I'm going to be a workaholic for the rest of my life. Instead, my prayer 21 years ago was, Lord, teach me how to play. Teach me how to rest. What does Sabbath look like? And then it was, Lord, why am I so driven? What am I trying to prove? And literally the Lord instantly took me back to one of my first jobs in ministry. I, you know, as a youth pastor, took me back to literally the exact moment and said, when this situation happened, you stuck a, you know, a stake in the ground and said, if I'm the perfect leader, if I understand everybody, no one will talk bad about me. And, wow. and so like, that's why you work so the way you do is because you're trying to have this perfect reputation and, and just stop it. Like it's never, that's not going to happen. And so it's those things of understanding why I'm wired the way I am and then saying, God, help me grow. I don't want to stay this way. And so that's what we love about strength finders and, and Myers Briggs is it's seeking to understand. And even on a marriage side of things, you know, uh, first Peter talks about husbands live with your wives in an understanding way. Well, you know, I think everyone jokes like, yeah, you can't understand women or, and and I don't even get this a husband understand wives. It's both. It's, I need to understand my husband. And so honestly, the top thing I do is I study my husband. I study him. I study him. I still ask him questions daily. Do you need this? What can I do for you? I don't assume I know we've been best friends for 25 years and I still don't assume I know what he needs. I know what he's thinking. I'm always just studying him so I can understand him so I can a serve him, but also appreciate him and not compare myself to him. That's so good. I'm while we're on the topic of family, I I'm just curious. So obviously you study him. How have you guys balanced working and leading together with raising a family? Has, has that been easy? Have you had a set of boundaries around work and, and family? Those are great questions. You know, it, I think it helped that we, we got married at 20, you know, started serving in the church at 21 together, our first ministry job. And, and I laughed because 
they, they gave us one office. We had one computer. We were both called youth pastors. He was not the senior youth pastor. I was not the junior. It was just your youth pastors figure it out. And so we would fight like cats and dogs. And, you know, and so, you know, it was definitely so many people say to me, I could never work with my husband you know, or wife. Well, we definitely fought it out and, and, <laughs> and really had to figure out our roles and our strengths and what we were good at. And so part of it was just kind of coming into ourselves and, and realizing, you know, my husband is good at he is a brilliant thinker, strategic, futuristic. He's a, a speaker. He's a writer. I, he's a big picture vision person. I'm the detail girl. I love administration. I love making lists. And so we're a good team in that I'm like, you dream big, I will help make it happen. You know, and wow. so really being secure in that role and not feeling like I don't need credit for helping write his sermon or for helping write his book. Like I don't need to prove anything to him. I just love doing what I'm called to do with the way that God has wired me. And so when it comes to, so we waited five years, had kids, uh, you know, I always say the word balance it's actually not a good word when it comes to life, ministry, family. Like there is no balance. Um, it's 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 not something that's even I think you should strive for because balance says that everything's equal. And I don't even think Jesus lived a life of everything being equally balanced. But what what we do see Jesus doing, and what I believe it's navigation. And so I compare marriage, family, ministry, life, children, all of it to really you're driving a car and you're navigating. And if you think about it. Like you have to pay attention to not just the weather, the road conditions, the drivers around you, the people in your car. You know what I mean? Is the music too loud? Are people being crazy in your car? You know, and, and you're constantly adjusting to everything around you. So your hands are on the wheel. You're alert. You can't go into autopilot when you're driving. And so I would say the same thing with life. It's constantly adaptable. You're adjusting. And so Peter and I are constantly having conversations of how are we doing? You know, we're analyzing. We have four questions. We, we just ask ourselves a lot. And when I say we ask ourselves these questions, we don't sit down for coffee and go through a list. But it's, they're always these questions are in the back of our mind. And, and these are the four questions. It's what's working, what's not working, what's missing, and what's confusing. And it's that concept of what's working in our marriage, what's working in our exercise, what's working in our parenting right now, what's not working. You know, and we're just having those questions and we've chosen to not be defensive or offended. And we make sure it's a safe place to have those conversations so we can say, hey, date night isn't working and we're not getting all insecure and offended by that. And hey, our schedule isn't working right now. Um, working out isn't happening. What are we going to do about it? So we're having those conversations without saying, hey, are you saying I'm fat? You don't have to say like, <laughs> <laughs> you got to be able to have those conversations in your marriage without getting defensive and insecure and just saying, hey, I love him. He loves me. We've got to be able to have a safe place to ask those questions. And, and, and then we, we even like look at our schedule a month in advance and kind of map out when's our date day, when's our family night, like, because life will fill up with tons of things. And so we make sure we have margin, you know, that we, we know what we can handle, but it's because we've made lots of mistakes and we've had what I call lots of freakouts. And so I tell our staff, I tell leaders all the time, freakouts are good. Freakouts are healthy. They actually show you your limits. And so what do I mean by a freakout? Peter and I will have a freakout of I hate life. I hate people. You know what I mean? Like life <laughs> isn't working. I overbooked my schedule. I'm crashing physically. Or I'm crashing emotionally. This isn't working. And instead, there's two ways you can respond. If you have a freakout, in your home or work, you can like go into shame, condemnation, insecurity, and be like, what's wrong with me? I can't do it all. Or you can actually interpret it as a healthy sign of limits and going, thank you, God, for giving my physical and emotional body limits. And I need to be okay with what I'm able to do. Help me navigate with the hours of time that I have. Help me be strategic. And so it's, it's managing our energy and it's managing our time. And and so we've learned we can only do so many nights out a week. We've learned like when I speak at a conference or if I speak even at our own church, there's a cost on my family. There's a cost on our eating. And so like literally we, you know, eat terrible foods whenever I preach. And so people are like, why don't you preach more? And I'm like, because my family eats <laughs> terrible that week. I'm like an absentee mother, you know. And so we, have, so now I've got a whole team of ladies that like bring me food whenever oh, I awesome. preach, you know, because they just want to make sure that, you know, it's just fun. So, but it's identifying I can't do it all. I'm not supposed to do it all. God gave us limits for a reason. And again, not as an excuse for laziness, but just as an excuse to navigate, hey, who am I? What are my strengths? So, for, so again, for Peter and I, it's, I study him. He knows me. We know ourselves. We know each other. And then we create a win-win. And, and when you do that, it's not about am I a stay-at-home mom or am I a working mom? Am, you know, am I paid or not? Do I have a title or not? You know, like, do I get credit for what I'm doing or not? Like, it's, 
you're secure and I know who I am. I'm a daughter of God. This is the family I'm in. I know my husband. The best way for our family to thrive is for me to fill in the blank. It might be working. It might be being home, but I don't get my identity from that. What I'm doing It's I'm secure in that, Hey, this is a win for our family. And when our family thrives, everything is great. You know what I mean? It's, it's the idea of what's works best. And so that's kind of been our philosophy of how we've navigated all the seasons of, of marriage, ministry, kids, church planting. My role changes every year. It has never stayed the same. And every senior leader, every pastor's wife I know never has the same job description for years. You know what I mean? It's, it's a constant evolution of changing to what's God doing? What's my season? Who am I? What's my spouse? How can we work together? And then in that security, I also can't, then I don't compare myself to other pastors. I've got so many brilliant pastor friends and they're just so different than us. And instead of comparing myself, you know, a few years ago, Insecure Carolyn would have compared myself to other pastors and went, they're extroverted. They have all this energy and they're super organized in this and that, and we have different strengths. And, and, and instead I can just go, you know what? This is how God's wired us. This is our gift to the body of Christ. And so let's just be who we're going to be. Let's love life. Let's love God. Let's love each other. And let's be faithful in everything. That was so good. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, this is our first time connecting, but I, I can't believe you're introverted. You have such like, you have very, very high energy and you're very passionate. I love it. So, uh, that's it's a learned me. behavior. It's a learned behavior. People are shocked about my husband because he comes up extroverted in the pulpit and in life, but he is such an introvert. But again, hmm. part of that was he's 20 years old, started out as a youth pastor and he literally read his personality and his personality as an INTJ. It said, you come off aloof, arrogant, people are intimidated of you and you're unapproachable. And if he's nice. like, well, that's not going to work for pastor. You know? <laughs> and so literally 21 years, he has worked on being wow. approachable and not coming off a loop and not coming off arrogant, but it has been a learned behavior. And so like, that's again, why we also say personalities are not an excuse for behavior. You yeah. know, it's, it's how God wired you, but you do what God's called you to do despite your personality. That's so good. I'm, I'm just curious. So you, did he naturally, are you guys just naturally growth oriented where you wanted to change? Because sometimes one, people are just blind to, to their blind spots or the, the downfalls of the person or the quote unquote dark side of their personality and they're unwilling to change. Is that, I'm just curious how you help people grow. I mean, do people just have to get a revelation themselves of, Hey, these are areas I need to grow in and do it. I don't know. I don't know if I asked that properly, but do you know what I'm asking? Yeah, no, I think so. I, I think growth is a tricky thing. I think you have to realize your need for growth. And I think a lot of times we don't realize it until we hit painful moments until, you know, um, mm. there's an issue with our children or there's an issue in the marriage or there's an issue in the, or, in the workplace or in the church or the organization. And you hit a lid, you hit a wall and you go, Oh, I can either grow or I can start making an excuse for what's happening right now. And so, you know, immature reactions would be, I'm going to blame other people for the current situation I'm in. I'm going to blame others from this wall that I hit or for the pain, you know, um, and, and, and a mature person is going to say, God, what do you want to reveal to me right now? And what do you want to speak to me? And what do you want to reveal to me about myself? And then what do you want to reveal to me about yourself? And, and it's that really asking God, um, and then having honest people in your life that you can be that are safe, that you can say, Hey, what do you see in me? How can I, improve my communication or what are some blind spots that you see, but it has to be a really safe, safe place to have those conversations. Yeah. Uh, I, I just wanted open-ended just advice to two groups of leaders. One, I want you to talk to young leaders. Uh, and then after that, we'll talk about women in leadership, but what would, if you had any yeah. advice to give young leaders, what would it be? Oh, I love that question because you know, when I was a young leader, honestly, I was trying to prove out my calling. And part of it was because our first pastor and mentor said to us, you think you're called in the ministry, prove it. And so we would work 80 hours a week trying to prove out and not in a legalistic, but trying to show, sure. yep, we're called, we can build something. You know what I mean? And so part of it, there was a healthy, he just threw us in the deep end of the pool and said, build a youth ministry. And we did. <laughs> um, but I feel like even when I go back to so nine years of pastoring in Wisconsin, and then we planted substance. And if there's any regret, if I go back to myself, you know, in those early church planting years is I feel like we, I don't want to say that we're prostituted ourselves, but like we gave of every part of our lives, every space of our home, every bit of our moment to just reach every single person that would possibly, you know, come to substance. And I feel like I spent more time doing that striving than actually 
praying. And I don't say that, and again, that sounds so spiritual. Like you got to do both. You got to work hard and you got to pray hard. But what I've seen, especially even in church planting, I've seen there's so many church planters that part of it, there's a naivety and that's actually what causes someone to plant a church. And you got to have that. You got to have, you know, but there's also this, I'm going to be the next fill in the blank superstar church planter. That's going to become an instant mega church because I've got something unique to give. And and that's, that's actually not what God has for the majority of us. And I don't, and, and I'm all, I'm not about talking about church size being right or wrong. It's a journey. And, and you don't get a kid, you don't adopt a 25 year old and, and then they instantly have all of your DNA. You, God gives you a baby and then you yeah. have to raise this baby. And then as you raise this baby, you don't get frustrated at your three-year-old that they can't be logical. You know what I mean? Like you, it's, it's a three-year-old. So you celebrate what a three-year-old can do. And so I think part of it, I'd tell young leaders like, hey, understand the season you're in and expectation management and stop comparing yourself with other people because they have a different backstory and they have different experiences and, and they have a different calling and different gifts. And so just, I know the season that you're in and celebrate it. And so when we were a three-year-old church, we would tell people, hey, we're a chubby, fat toddler. That's really cute right now. You know what I mean? And so like, we're going to celebrate the fact that we're a three-year-old church and not a 30 year old church, you know what I mean? Because 30 year old churches have way different systems and, and what may much more assets. And so anyway, that's one thing I would tell young leaders is it's the striving to prove really um, proving themselves. And the, and the other thing I've seen is if as a leader, you have not dealt with your issues, if you have not dealt with your identity, if you have not dealt with your ego, if you have got daddy issues or mommy issues, or, you know, you wounded from past leaders and you are, trying to do what you're doing to to validate yourself as a person I'm telling you you're going to crash and burn you know and so I I see it all the time so if if leadership or ministry is done you know to build your own voice your own platform your own vision because if you're trying to it says something about you it's going to get funky and awkward and and so I would say to a young leader focus on your character focus on your issues your job is not to be the expert your job is to learn and ask lots of questions. If you're in a staff or an organization, your job is to serve the vision. You're not the visionary. Your job is to honor, to work hard. Don't add drama. And I would say to you, your confidence and leadership, it's directly tied to your intimacy with God. You know, don't let your ego or identity um, in what you do or the org chart or your title or your pay, like, don't let that get in the way. Like you are most indispensable to an organization when you're not distracted with your own issues and you need to be affirmed and you're feeding the monster of your ego. You know, like that's where I've seen things get crazy and dysfunctional in, in ministries and in nonprofits. It's when, when we haven't dealt with our own issues. And so what I would say to a young leader is, man, be a counselor, read as many books by Henry Cloud as you can. Like, yes. healthy <laughs> as you, can. you know, like deal with your issues. Say, God, like break me now because I'm telling you, I, hit a breaking point in my leadership where I all of a sudden couldn't do it all. And I remember I, I cried for three months and it was like, mm. because I couldn't pastor everybody and I couldn't um, meet everybody We had too many campuses and too many services. And, and then people were talking about me and saying, Oh, well, Carolyn believes this and she is substance believes this. And they misunderstood our hearts and I couldn't defend myself. And, and you know what, that breaking of me was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. Cause it just, it caused me to let go of my reputation and trust God to be my defender. And it, it, it shook me in such a, lo- a, a good way of going, this isn't about me. This isn't about me as a leader. This is about God, you know, and, and, and him growing the church and I'm going to be faithful and I'm going to work hard and I'm going to be healthy and I'm going to be in the presence of God. And I'm going to get my confidence in leadership from the presence of God not striving in my own strength. And and a biblical example of this would be Moses. You know, he, he tried, you know, he, he he tried at age 40 to deliver the Israelites with his own giftings, his own strength, his own ego. He's well-educated in the palace and it backfired and he had to go to the desert for 40 years. And then he's this reluctant leader that really becomes insecure. And, and God had to really do a deep work in him to even lead. And then you see in Exodus 33, Moses gets to the point in his leadership where he's like, if your presence does not go with me, I'm not going anywhere because it's your presence that sets me apart. And, and, and that's honestly, I don't feel like young leaders understand that. And, and hear my heart. I'm not saying let's all be revivalists 
and we just sit in the presence of God for nine hours a day and we actually don't do work and we don't do leadership and organizational teachings. And I, I'm not talking about extremism. I'm just saying there is a healthy understanding the presence of God. And, and then let's forward in the Old Testament, let's forward you know, years to Joshua. And you look in numbers when it's the story of the spies and the 10 spies say, we can't, there's giants in the land. And then it's Joshua and Caleb that say, no, God has said it. He's going to do it. Joshua was Moses' assistant, and Joshua was in the tent of meeting when Moses was in the tent of meeting in the presence of God. And there are times in, in the Bible where it talks about Moses would leave the tent of meeting, and Joshua stayed in the tent. So Joshua knew the presence of God. And I believe, again, that intimacy that Joshua had with God is what caused him to be the leader in the book of Numbers saying, hey, we can actually do this. Again, his confidence wasn't because he was a, a ninja warrior that had the skills to conquer the giants. The circumstance didn't change. The facts were the same for all 12 of the spies, but we saw the confidence in the presence of God that, John, that uh, Joshua had that made him differentiated as a leader. That's so awesome. And can you talk to women in leadership? That'll be the last group to talk to. Yeah. Okay. So women in leadership, I love, <laughs> I love women in leadership. And I, I first want to say I'm, I'm really blessed because I didn't grow up with any wounds, um, you know, or any wounds from men in leadership. I have a husband who has believed in me from day one and has been my biggest cheerleader and has constantly trying to empower me. In fact, he actually gave me the title in the organization as co-lead pastor. So it's not like something I said, Hey, you know, I think I should be the co-lead pastor of this church. He's like, baby, you are the co-lead pastor, like, you need this title. And I was like, okay, sure, whatever. You know what I mean? Because again, I don't need the title, but he's the one that gave it to me. So I, hmm. I feel like I, I've been able to navigate women in ministry and women in leadership as a woman without some of the baggage of being in uh, circles or teachings that were maybe oppressive towards women or just not inclusive towards women. So I think that's, that's helped. Um, as far as when it comes to women in leadership, one of the things I, I do a lot to invest in women, um, but I'm pretty strong, like even with our staff, with the women in our church, I'm always telling them like, hey, I don't want to hear the gender card. I don't want to hear I'm a woman, therefore I'm not being promoted or I'm not getting a certain opportunity because I'm a woman. Um, I, I just, because when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, there is no one that can stop you. Your age, your gender, your background, your ethnicity, no one can argue with someone who's filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and so, you know, I, the, the biblical example we all know is, is Deborah, which we love. But what I love about Deborah is it was a time in an era where women weren't leaders, and yet she was this judge. She gets this word from the Lord and, and calls the commander and says, hey, you're supposed to do this, and God's going to give you victory, and this is what you're supposed to do. And I love his response, like, okay, sure but I'm not doing it unless you come with me. And, and so I always, you know, was it because Deborah was a soldier? No, it's because she could hear from God. And so I thought, I want the men in my life to not want me in the room because I'm a woman and it feels, you know, affirmative action. Like I want them because dude, Carolyn is filled with the presence of God. We do not want to have this meeting without her again, not because I'm a woman, but because I'm a leader. And, hmm. and I think the other scripture that's important is first Timothy four twelve. Paul's talking to Timothy, who's young, you know, I think estimate maybe he was 17 and, and Paul's saying, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers. And, and I like to take that scripture and honestly say, don't let anyone look down on you because you are uneducated or because you're poor or because you're divorced or because you're a single mom or unemployed or black, white, brown, old, young, pretty, ugly, overweight, too thin, short, tall, on staff, not on staff. You have a title or you don't have a title. Listen, we are told, set the example. Set the example with your faith, with your purity, with your life, with your words. And, and I would argue one of the ways we set an example is by spending time with the Lord. And, and so that's really been my encouragement to our women leaders. I'll invest in, in them. I'll te do special teachings for them. I'll help navigate the, you know, what it's like to be a woman in ministry. But I am absolutely, I will not allow anyone to have an excuse or a chip on their shoulder or you know, use it as a victim card of, I'm not getting a certain opportunity because, because anytime you, you have a victim mentality, you're actually not trusting in God. You actually are revealing 
that you don't believe God can open any door for you. You know, I love the book of Revelation, you know, um, in the book of Revelation, it says, I have opened a door that no man can shut. I mean, that's the God we serve is he opens doors for us. I don't need to push doors open for myself. And again, but that's all rooted in your identity in Christ. And do you know that God is your father and he's generous and loving? And, and, and so it's that becoming a healthy leader and, and being rooted in your relationship with God. Man, this, this has been phenomenal so far. And I know for me personally, so I'm, I'm asking of myself, but I would say if someone's listening to this and they're saying, man, Carolyn is amazing. I love this content. I want to connect with her. I want to get their content. What's the best way that we can connect with you and Peter um, and, and consume the content that maybe you're putting out and God's putting in your hearts? Absolutely. So substancechurch.com is our church website. My husband's blog is peterhaas.org. And then he's got two books that he's written that I helped him write. And, and they're, I'm so proud of them because they're, they're really our story and they're the lessons of what God's shown us. And through the journeys of 21 years of ministry and, and pain and, and then my, and they're written so funny. So it's like, they're literally one third up comedy. So they're written, you know, and then they're one third research, nerdy research, and then one third deep theology that like nobody ever talks about. So the first book is called Pharisectomy, how to remove your inner Pharisee and other religiously transmitted diseases. It's <laughs> awesome. Like it is, it's, it's so good. And then the second book he wrote that's more recent is called Broken Escalators. And it's literally the 10 myths of promotion and happiness and what we think will make us happy. And so we, so part of even what I'm talking about is some of these myths where it's the idea of, I feel stuck. My life feels stuck on this escalator. Everyone else's life is zooming up and their escalator is moving, but mine's broken. What's going on? And so it's 10 myths that we think, things that we think will make us happy but actually God's working on us and he's working on our character. And so my husband wrote it over four years of literally four years that were some of the toughest years for us in ministry where God was shaking us and it was delays and it was betrayals and it was just years of pain where, you know, we were being shook to the core and just seeking the Lord and seeking the Lord and the lessons that God taught us. And so I'm so proud of them. And, you know, not just, I don't want to sound like I'm just promoting my husband's books, but they're our story. You know what I mean? And so I think I just, people will be so encouraged about who God is and that he's writing a story that only he could get the credit for. I love that. I'll include uh, links to all of those in the show notes as well. Hey everyone, thank you so much for listening to our interview with Carolyn. I hope that it added value to your life. You can find ways to connect with her, links to everything that we discussed, and more in the show notes at l3leadership.org forward slash episode 176. Also, if you enjoy this interview, you can also listen to our lightning round interview with Carolyn in episode number 177. I want to thank our sponsor, Henny Jewelers. They are a jeweler owned by my friend and mentor, John Henny. My wife, Laura, and I got our engagement and wedding rings through Henny Jewelers, and we just think they're an incredible company. Not only do they have great jewelry, but they also invest in people. John gave Laura and I a book to help us prepare for marriage, and he's also been investing in me as a leader, a dad, and a husband now for many years. If you're in need of a good jeweler, check out hennyjewelers.com. And as always, if this podcast added value to your life, we would encourage you to subscribe and leave a rating and review. And it would also mean the world to us if you would share it with your friends. Thank you so much for being a listener. And if you want to stay up to date with everything we're doing here at L3 Leadership, just go to our brand new website at l3leadership.org and you'll find everything that you need to stay up to date with what we're doing. As always, I like to end with a quote and I'll quote Brian Houston this time. He said, strength of character will help keep your life intact when the world around you is unraveling integrity is the key to longevity. I love that. Thanks for listening and being a part of L3 Leadership. Laura and I appreciate you so much, and we'll talk to you next episode.